Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 263 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Dancing for Diabetes, Dexcom, and Omnipod. You can go to dancing4diabetes.com, myomnipod.com forward slash juice box, or dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more. I hope you're ready for another diabetes pro tip because this episode with Jenny Smith is all about fat and protein. That's right. How do you bolus for the thing that they tell you doesn't need insulin, but really does? We're going to tell you right here. And after you're done with this episode, episode 263, special bonus episode number 264 is available right now. That episode is with Vicky. Vicky is eating keto, and she's going to talk us through how she boluses for her keto diet. Because guess what? You need insulin for protein and fat. And if you don't know that, you're going to love this episode. Now, even if you're not eating keto, Vicky's episode is going to give you a ton of insight into the timing of fat and protein. It's actually sort of interesting to look at if you're not a keto. Well, it's interesting if you are on keto, but if you're not it's still really insightful because you get to strip away the carbs and just see where the protein comes into effect. It's almost like that, you know, if you do row, row, row your boat, you start singing and then the other side of the room starts singing. Like when does the second tier of row, row, rowers come in? When does the fat and protein start working? Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical plan or becoming bold with insulin. You, however, do not have to talk to your doctor about going to juiceboxpodcast.com and picking up a t-shirt or a mug or something like that, you know, to help support the show. A half an hour before you and I started recording this, someone sent me a message on Instagram and said, How do I deal with fat and protein overnight? Because I was bolusing all night with my kid. So I I texted them back and I said, hey, great timing. Can you see my recording calendar from where you're at? And uh, hold tight because the answer is coming. This is another one that Jenny proposed that I'm really interested in. And I don't know how much help I'm going to be. Why don't we start with what I know? (laughs) Because it's so little. Awesome. (laughs) So... For, for seriously, so for everyone who listens to the podcast and knows that I'm just sort of fluid with insulin, right? Like more, uh, more need equals more insulin, and so because of that, I don't usually stop and think about whether that means it's protein or fat or what it is. Just if Arden's blood sugar seems to require insulin, I, I give it more. I'm assuming I've been handling fat and protein rises forever. You're not dissecting her meals. You're just saying I see the need. I'm giving more insulin. That's kind of what you do. Yeah. I see diabetes yeah. as a forest fire and I fly over it with a giant plane full of water and just drop <laughs> all the water on top of it. And I go, oh, look, we <laughs> got most of it. And, uh, and. Oh, and look at that's where the fire started yeah, is what the is fireman right. comes in yeah. and looks at. And Scott's like, I didn't really care where it started. I just want to f- take care of it. Meaningless <laughs> to me. I'll go get another plane full of insulin and uh, drop it back on again. So, uh. <laughs> So I never really think about stuff like that. I do a little more, obviously, as you and I have been speaking as the years go past, um, but I find it to be, it's another level. Like sometimes I joke about things being Mm -hmm. like, like ninja level. Like I think that you don't really need to know about fat and protein if you're doing what I do, but you do need to know if you want to start understanding things in a bigger way. So I'm really excited to do this. Now, the only thing I know about protein is that I do indiscriminately bolus for protein. I don't know why I do it, but I do it. So where some people might look at a plate and go, oh, there's uh, potatoes. Well, that's, you know, this many carbs. But then there's a, you know, a cheeseburger. Well, that's meat. I don't do that. And here's a roll that rolls 25 carbs. And, you know, and we're going to have broccoli. And I don't know. Broccoli probably has five or six carbs in it. Like, so I look at, yeah, plate, good I, job. I look at, I look at a plate, I go broccoli, <laughs> eh, six, the roll, let's call it 30. Then I look at the potatoes and I go, eh, I don't know, 35. And then and then I, look, <laughs> then I look at the burger and I go, eh, let's call it 10. And we'll extend it for a little bit. And and so that that's me looking at a cheeseburger with mashed potatoes and broccoli, right? Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why I do that with the burger. <laughs> Other than I know people who eat incredibly low carb who tell me mm-hmm. that they bolus for their protein, but farther out from when they actually ingest it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Is any of that right? If visiting dancing for diabetes is wrong, I don't want to be right. Not about this. I want to be right about the fat and protein thing, but I would not want to be right about visiting dancing for diabetes being wrong if it was wrong, which it's not. I think you should definitely do it. Dancing the number four diabetes.com. You know, studies show that if ads are incredibly confusing, they work so much better. Check out Dancing for Diabetes on Instagram and Facebook. Throw them a like. It's a really great organization. Dancing the number four diabetes.com. Even if you're not interested, could you go like their pages because they paid for this and now I'm listening back to it and I didn't do a very good job. So let's at least give them their money's worth. Is any of that right? <laughs> because yeah. I <laughs> Yes. So I, and, and again, I, from the standpoint of looking, you're not doing this in a blind way. You have, you have the method that you've developed for analyzing, looking at Arden's control and her management and what happens here and what happens there. And you remember it. I know you've got like this, like library of like times of this has happened you can like pick from them scott and you're like i know this happened last time so let's time this time for the burger and 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 broccoli we're gonna give 10 for the the burger because i know what happened last time and something was off and the carb count for everything else was right right in context though for everybody who's listening and why would you need to bolus for protein um it's really Typically, two points that you'd need to bolus for protein. One, you brought up the low carb eaters or those who are eating lower carb at times. If you've got a meal that's typically less than about 15 to 20 grams of carb and a normal amount of, of protein, not like this big 16 ounce steak, but a typical, you know, five ounce chicken, four or five ounce chicken breast, mm-hmm. let's say, you're usually going to need about 40, 50, sometimes even 60% of the amount of protein in the aftermath of that meal in order to accommodate for your body's own digestion of protein in a low carb environment. Because remember, carb is the body's natural first fuel, right? Okay. If there's not enough of that first fuel there, your body looks to another source like protein, digests it down, and you get a usable amount of glucose out of protein, even if it's not a huge amount of protein eaten in a lower carb environment. The opposite of that would be, let's say um, she has a high carb meal or anybody has a high carb meal that's like the meat lover's pizza, okay? And which is not only a huge amount of carb as well as a huge amount of fat, but you've got this large amount of protein. Let's say instead of your standard like 25 gram portion of protein, which is like about the size of the palm of a woman's hand. That's about 20 to 25 grams of protein. That's a pretty normal amount. Okay. If you've got this huge amount of protein that you're taking in, even in a normal amount of carb or a high amount of carb, you're still going to need bolus for about, let's say 50% of that protein, but it's going to be a drawn out type of insulin need. So both of those scenarios would require you to take, you're doing like a dual bolus. You're extending some of it, assuming you're meeting that protein kind of need for a while. Protein bolus typically is a good idea is at the end of the meal to set an extended bolus with 0% delivered up front and 100% extended out over about a three hour time period. And that's just for where proteins impact usually starts impacting about two ish hours after a meal. And then by about three hours, you're too high and you might sit high and correct to try to get it back down. When in effect, had you used what you used to correct to actually bolus for the protein, you wouldn't have had the rise to correct to begin with. Yeah, I got it. It's parallel to the idea of over bolusing, like when you can't pre bolus right. and you throw in a ton extra to handle the rise before the rise yep. happens. Okay. Yep. So I, yep, exactly. I, I bolus the meal normally, then I finish eating and I put in this amount for the protein in an extended bolus, 0% right. up front, the rest of it out over maybe three hours. Correct. Correct. So, so basically, I'm creating a heavier blanket of insulin over the time frame where the food's going to have impact. Where the protein's going to have the impact or where you're assuming from previous experience with meals like that, that impact is going to kind of fall in. And fat is even longer. 
Right. Yeah, as we've kind of talked about before, fat can have impact up to 10 to 12 hours after eating high fat. How does that technically happen? So I, that, these are where my questions exist. And by the way, I just, everyone listening, I just stared at Jenny while she said that and thought, oh, I'm in a master's class about diabetes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so so fat, as an example, um, when how does fat, does it slow down digestion? Like why does fat hold up blood sugar? I don't understand, I guess. Yeah. So one, it's also usually the reason, as you just said, fat does slow digestion a bit. It's a, it's a tough, um, nutrient for your body to break down and and make use of. So even if there's a ton of carb with it, it's often the the reason that somebody eats a pizza and they're like, wow, I must have nailed that carb count because my blood sugar is like beautiful, rock steady, flat, no rise at all. And then all of a sudden later, they get this like creep and the creep happens and it happens. And then you ride high and you're like throwing insulin at it and dumping the plane worth of insulin. On it. You're like, what's the problem here? You know, it's kind of, it's, it's, and it's annoying, right? Especially for people who may not realize where it's coming from because they've never been told what it potentially could be. So it's not a miss, missed amount of carb, but it is the reason that you had that nice flat look in the aftermath of eating that, let's call it pizza. Otherwise, if you just ate the pizza crust, I guarantee that pizza crust is going to give you a rise yeah. without the fat being there, yeah. right? Even yeah, if you did bolus, right, 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 yeah. right, bread or potatoes or whatever it is. Now, fat, the other reason it impacts blood sugar is because as it gets into the system, it creates a, a rise in triglycerides in the bloodstream, which is a stress on the system. So we know what stress does to blood sugar, right? But as a stressor, it it impacts insulin use as if um, as if it's reducing it by about fifty percent. Mm-hmm. So let's say your basal overnight is running at one point zero units an hour, and it works beautiful. You've tested it. You know that it does what it's supposed to do, but in the effect of pizza or anything high fat, nachos and cheese or whatever it, you know, the whole bucket of chocolate, whatever it is, <laughs> you essentially have a basil now that's functioning almost at like 0.5 mm-hmm. instead of one. And so you are not getting the impact of all the basil you need. Your blood sugar climbs because of the fat and it stays high because of the fat and it can be long duration. So, I mean, you know, we typically recommend people accommodate for a high fat meal or something, you know, high fat in nature, like the whole Hagen does Sunday bar or whatever, 50% increase in basil at the end of the meal. Okay. And you extend it out over eight hours. Wow. A 50% basil increase over eight hours for a ton yep. of fat. See, that's, for a ton of fat. That's where so Jenny, so there's a couple of things in there, but the one thing she just said was how the the impact of the food sort of gives the the appearance that your basil's only at half power because because now your body needs so much more insulin. It's funny because that's stuff we say, I've been saying for years, but I never thought of mm-hmm. it that way, right? I never considered it mm-hmm. the way you just said it. I always say right. the body, like, you know, in high carb situations, you need more basil. That just makes sense. If, you know, if one unit keeps you stable when you're not, you know, when you're not putting the body through through the paces, then when you right. then when you're attacking it with ice cream or pizza or something like that, it stands to reason that you would need more in that situation, right? To meet the need. But it's interesting the way you put it. I hope that maybe that'll find uh, strike other people maybe at the core of their thinking because that's a neat idea. Like when when you're using that kind of food, it's as if you don't have enough basil by half. Correct. So they have they Correct. have something to like measure with. Even the idea of eight hours. I think the the genius behind the extended, you know, uh, the temp basal increase over that much time is that if you do start to trend down at some point, you can just make you can the always decision, turn it off. Hey, the food's out of my system now. I can shut it off. Maybe I'll have to recorrect this a tiny right. bit to, you know, but that's it. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And or maybe you got enough temping increase for quite a while and now it's going to navigate down as you turn it off. And you may not necessarily get 100% back to target, but you're certainly going to navigate down to a much lower number than you would have been had you not done that at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you have to know by now, if you've been listening this long, that you would rather stop a low or falling blood sugar than a fight with a high one. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's simple. How much... Um, truth is in the way my brain thinks about like more dense carby stuff like a soft pretzel or pizza or something like that 
in that it sits in my stomach and it breaks down slower so that it has more opportunity to run. So my blood sugar is being impacted right over a longer period of time, sometimes mm-hmm. past when the impact of my bolus is there. Mm-hmm. That is, do I think about that correctly? Or is that just the cartoon yeah. way that works? For no, it's, it's a great way to kind of think about it and also plan to bolus for it. And some of that also takes experience, mm-hmm. right? It takes experience seeing, well, gosh, whenever I eat this soft pretzel, it's all carb. And unless you're like dipping it in the cheese sauce or mm-hmm. something high fat that kind of comes along with it, the vat of butter, if you're just eating the soft pretzel, it's all carb. But the the dense nature of it may be what requires a little bit more drawn out because you don't necessarily need that quick impact all up front. You may need some, but then you're going to need it for a little bit longer in the aftermath. Yeah. The same is true for some of those um, like more whole grain, hearty types of um, starchy foods, things like wild rice or quinoa or, you know, those kinds of things. They've got um, a better fiber complex to them. They've not been processed. They're going to break down slower and they're going to have a lower glycemic impact. So you may need to draw out the bolus a little bit in order to prevent having a low before it kind of impacts or hits you later. You have to stop thinking about the food goes in and my blood sugar tries to go up right away. So I'll get, Mm. that's not, that's why your timing's messed up. Like you have to understand a little bit how the food makes its way through your system. Mm -hmm. High carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, you know, and in between there, the, the, um, you know, I used to tell people like, try to imagine an overlay machine, like, but then that got like an old idea, you know, like (laughs) you're in school and they do the, you know, the somebody would write on a piece of plastic and it would, they'd shine it up on the board. Yep. Yep. I used to say, take two pieces of plastic instead and make one like a line of the impact of where your insulin's hitting and one, a line of where the food's hitting. The, the, the goal is you have to slide those slight, those pieces of plastic left and right and make a meat until they match up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can't, you can't just throw in all the insulin now and just hope it hits because you hear people say all the time, like, Oh, I bolused and I got low and then I got high later. None of this Mm -hmm. makes sense. Diabetes. And I'm like, no, you're you're so close. Like you, it, it's interesting, Jenny. Earlier, you said that I look at a plate and I just know from experience and everything. I also think I just know. I don't know why I know, and, mm-hmm. and that's important to understand. Like I can't quantify it for you. Sometimes I can just look at a plate and go, "That's this much insulin." I know it, mm-hmm. and it is obviously from something. But at the same time, I have privately. <laughs> I, I, for the one person who called me an egomaniac in a recent review, this is not me being egotistical. I'm just telling a story. But I, um, <laughs> I, I fixed two kids' basal rates this week mm-hmm. remotely. And mm-hmm. they sent me a, a graph. And as soon as I looked at the graph, I thought, oh, I know what's wrong with this. But I couldn't explain it to you. Like, right. do you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't write a manual about why this graph right. points to what it points to. But I knew as soon as I saw it. And mm-hmm. I think everybody can get to that because mm-hmm. I know who I am. I know what I got in school for grades. I can't possibly be that <laughs> smart, right? So so seriously, like I think time just teaches. And please, it does. this is not an invitation for everyone to send me their thing. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I am, by the way, it did make me think, Jenny, I think there's got to be a way to start a service where you take people's graphs and make basal recommendations back from the graphs. Because once you get people moving in the right direction with their basal, they start to see mm-hmm. it. And then they can dial, yeah. then they can dial it in on their own. Then they don't need you. This this person, mm-hmm. this lovely person is texting me. Uh, uh, you have to let me send you something because I'm going to be bugging you for the rest of my life. And I laughed and I said, A, you can't send me anything. And I don't, please, right. please I don't want anything. And, and but but B, you're not going to need me for like ever. Like right. three days right. from now, this is going to just make all the kind of sense in the world to you. It just right. starts to, you start to see it, you, you know? Right. Um, right. I wish The Matrix wasn't a 20 well, year old movie because it's such a great reference, but things start to slow it, down, you know? They do. And they start to, they start to come together in a way like, like Neo sort of all of a sudden, all of those images that are flooding the screen in The Matrix, like you said, that's a great movie to bring up in context here because it just, it comes together and his brain is like, I can see it all. It's clear. And 
I mean, diabetes, life with diabetes changes, variables come up, and there are always going to be new avenues to explore and figure out. But the intuition of the day to day management, the intuition gets easier. And I think that that's what you kind of you manage off of a lot of really good built in intuition of it's this it's this feeling and you can't, you can't often, I think other people would agree, you can't often put that down in writing. You can't say, I know how, I know how this is wrong. I can't tell you why, but I know this is how to fix it. I know this needs to be adjusted here. Or you need something else here or whatever. Now, some of it can be, you know, some of that intuition can be simplified if you do do some, um, you know, we're talking all about like food and the impact carbs and fats and proteins. And some of that, if you know, I've gotten a little bit into the science of why there's impact there from these foods that we don't really ever talk about. Fats and proteins are kind of like swept under the table when diabetes education comes, you know, comes up. It's usually all carbs, right? We focus on carbs, we learn how to carb count. And I mean, the basics of carb counting are pretty easy with a label. You look at the label for the serving size, you look down the label for the total carb amount, next down, you might look at fiber, if there's enough of it, you might, you know, deduct a little bit of it. But that's what we're taught. And then you're given this little ratio that's like, oh, for every 10 grams that you count from a label, you need this much insulin to take with it, right? So it's a, it's a very mathematical figure. But if we take it sort of one step farther than that very simple carb counting, as you mentioned before, not all carbs are created equal. You know, you could have 10 grams of counted, you know, celery versus 10 grams of counted watermelon there's going to be a different impact blood sugar wise from those carbs, even though the carb count is exactly the same. Yes. And so that it kind of brings in, can you be precise in carb counting to a degree? Mm -hmm. You can look at labels, you can measure, you can use weighted scales and all of that kind of thing. You can get precise, but from the standpoint of then understanding why blood sugar did this versus did this, you know, upswing, stable, flat, drop down, that actually, it takes it a step further into glycemic index and the nature of that food. And glycemic index also, in, it encompasses the components of a meal too, not just the carb at the meal, but like I said before with the pizza. You could have just the flat old pizza crust and bolus for that with just all the carb that's there. Your aftermath blood sugar is going to look very different than when you eat it as like a meat lover or an all over cheese pizza. There are different components there impacting how those carbs are going to change your blood sugar. Right. In case you missed it, episode 255 is a defining diabetes episode with Jenny where we go over glycemic index and load. Kelly and I went to the movies this weekend with Arden and her friend. We went to the snack stand and Arden chose a box of cookie dough bites and a slushy. I don't know if that's something that translates to all over the country, but just imagine pulverized ice with sugar water through it. Now, I'm not scared, right? I've got all the rules from this podcast and I've got Dexcom. I feel comfortable. Flip over the box for the cookie dough bites. 76 carbs for the whole box. I say to Arden, are you going to eat the whole box? She says, I don't know. The Slurpee, you're going to drink the whole thing? She says, mm, I don't know. I look at the lady at the stand. I went, any chance you got a carb count for this slushy thing? She looks at me and says, carb what? I said, ah, don't worry, everybody. Because we have a Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. I know what I'm going to do. So I just ballpark the carbs, right? I used the 76 carbs for the candy, thinking there's no way she's going to eat all the candy. But... You know, the slushy obviously has a ton of carbs in it that I can't even begin to guess. So we're just going to start with 76 carbs. Boom. Insulin goes in. Now we wait for the Dexcom to tell us that Arden starts trending above, you know, 120. As soon as she does, bajenga, more insulin. Throughout the hour and a half of the movie, we put on a number of different smaller boluses, which kept Arden's blood sugar around 170. And then we got her back down as soon as the slushy cookie dough concoction stopped going in. You know what I call that? Success. Arden saw a movie. She had a snack. There was an unknowable amount of carbs that impacted her in all different crazy ways. She did not get terribly high, and she never got low later. We accomplished that with the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. 
head over to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more. Results are mine and yours may vary. And when those variables are invisible to you, it causes you to say, oh, that's just diabetes. I can't do anything about that. That's just diabetes. Right. But there is, like I've, I've been saying forever, Jenny's just put it into specific words, which is beautiful. But I've been saying forever, if your blood sugar is getting really high or really low, you're not using the insulin correctly. I know that doesn't help you figure out how to use the insulin, but it should help you to know that there's still an answer. And right. just because you don't see it in the moment doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, it would be no different than if I sat down and looked at multivariable calculus. And then I, said, <laughs> and then I said to you, there's no answer to this. Well, a person who understands multivariable calculus would say, uh, of course there is. You just, right. you just don't understand calculus. And so the trick is with diabetes, how do you find the, the, the ideas that help you get through this stuff without everything turning into a calculus problem? Right. Like, how does it just become day to day, super simple and easy? And the reason you need to listen to Jenny is not only because uh, she, you know, teaches this stuff at Integrated Diabetes, not just because she's been living with type 1 diabetes for a very long time, not just because she's a CDE or a nutritionist, blah, 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 all that stuff, but she lives in a part of the country where food literally tries to kill people. So, um, (laughs) I mean, that, wow. I, my brother and Jenny live you know, reasonably near each other. And the things my brother describes as food uh, when he got there, I was like, Brian, that's not food. Don't eat that. And yeah. I, was, I was like... Matt, I would have to say Madison is sort of a little bit of an island in the state of Wisconsin. So yeah. Madison is a little bit... A little, we're, 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 we're a little beyond what the typical Wisconsinite... But yes. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> if you're rolling into a moment with uh, you know bratwurst on a roll with a beer... With some popcorn, so caramel, yeah, and cheese curds, deep fried, like you, boy, you, you need to know what you're doing, you know? (laughs) Right. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's where understanding and and learning things like, hey, fat and protein and all of these factors, they can have an impact for you. It's not all cut and dry, count the carbs, take the insulin and you've got it made. It's, it's not. And I, I hate saying that because it sounds like, well, gosh, I'm never going to get a handle on this if I have to start being a mathematician and, you know, figuring it all. Right. But you will if you just, if you think beyond what you were told. So if somebody tells right. you, like Jenny said, you know, flip the box over a half a cup of this is 10 carbs. You know, you get sick, you know, you get a unit for every 10 carbs. So that's a unit like that. But then once that doesn't work, you know, you guys have heard me say it a million times. It's insane to go back the next day, recount the same 10 carbs and go, okay, unit. Because that's what the math the doctor told me. No, no, no. I used a unit. My blood sugar went up. It took me three quarters of a unit to correct it. Next time, let's try a unit and a half or a unit. Right. You know, like try more because more, it took more, you know. Correct. You just have to like. You have it's to some evaluation. Past it. Yeah, you have to. I'm yeah. telling you for the people that I speak to over and over and over again, there's a moment where you just have to trust your gut. Like you have to trust that what you're seeing is actually happening, which is why I made one of the tenets of the podcast, you know, um, trust that what you know is going to happen is going to happen, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's just, that's simple. Like it's not, I, I, I say all the time, like it's not stacking if you need it. And somebody, I got a private message the other day that said that sentence unlocked my world. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, changed my life. And I thought, I'm glad I randomly said it because I didn't think of it ahead of time. I, I, you guys have been listening for a long time. You realize there's no notes in front of me. I've planned none of this. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Jenny and I start recording. And I go, hey, we're going to do like the fat and protein today, okay? And she goes, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's, it's about unlocking your mind from what, you know, the confines that you were giving at diagnosis. And mm-hmm. it's really, it's energizing to see it happen to people early in their diagnosis because then you know they're not going to live their whole life like this but it's rewarding to see someone who's lived with diabetes for a long time have like the light turn back on for them yeah i mean absolutely some of the messages you guys send are you guys owe me tissues you know what i mean so, um, <laughs> uh, it's really something okay so all right did we do we did carb counting basics right? like flip the box over take a look go by flip the box over yeah. yeah i mean if you wanted to go beyond the carb counting basics and get more into a little bit i mean taking it beyond would really be looking at the glycemic index but then one beyond would be glycemic load do you know what that is scott no. 
those are going to be defining diabetes things we're going to do after we stop recording this, Jenny. Ah, okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right. We're, Yay. We, we did well with this, I think. Yeah, I think so. Okay, don't forget that Defining Diabetes episode about glycemic index and load is back at episode 255. Let your podcast player keep running because episode 264 is the next episode. And it's with Vicki who will tell us how she handles a meal on a ketogenic diet. Keto, right? Now here's the great thing. Even if you're not on a keto diet, even if you're not doing low carb, the information is amazing because it shows you the timing of when proteins and fats hit a person. Try to imagine that Vicky's going to explain a meal to you that includes no carbs, and she's going to show you where the fat and protein comes into play. So you can kind of in your head separate out when the carbs hit to where the protein hits. Trust me, this is the capper for the episode with Jenny. I promise you. Go right from this one into 264. Thank you so much to the sponsors Dexcom, Omnipod, and Dancing for Diabetes. You can go to myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox, dancing the number four diabetes.com or dexcom.com forward slash juicebox to get started today or to find out about dancing for diabetes. Don't worry if all that confuses you. You can find links in the show notes of your podcast player or at juiceboxpodcast.com.